from Feng Kanxi, this is the wave where every nation is pursuing higher GDP. Nature is absent in our economic system. Biodiversity is the reason why human beings can stay in this planet for such a long time. Economic growth could sustain if the nature could be included in economics. Joining me now is Professor Sir Partha Sarathi Dasgupta, the prominent economist from University of Cambridge. Great to have you on the show, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, great to have you. Um, actually, before I do this interview, I do a lot of study. Of course, you have uh, mentioned about nature do not appear in our economics. Um, let's count nature in our economical system. Why you want to, of course, you say you want to set up a new grammar for economical system in economics. Why? this initiative really important for our economic system? Well, I would ask the reverse question. Yeah. Why is it not important, mm -hmm. given that everything we do is built on nature? We breathe, uh, we drink water, we grow food. All these are bounties of nature. So as a factor of production, nature is totally essential. And yet we ignore it, but instead think of the factors of production as buildings, roads, machines, and of course human uh, skills. But in our economic statistics, for example, uh, the statistic of gross domestic product, GDP, there's no mention of what is happening to nature in the process of producing goods and services because gross domestic product is the market value of the finished products of the economy, final products, if you like. And um, it doesn't include in it the possibility that in the process of economic growth, we have eaten into nature. That would be like a depreciation of nature, but it's not included. So the statistics hides the fact that our in economic activity, even though it's built on nature, um, could be tarnishing nature, eroding nature, but it's not recorded. Mm, so what? it's extremely important to have that included. Yes, that's what you said, eroding nature, because um, human beings, we have the economic uh, activities, of course, and we produce, uh, for example, carbon di dioxide, yes. uh, and uh, the forest have to has to, of course, absorb in, but they are voiceless That's right. in the market. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, why is ecological thinking and transformative action to access the value of biodiversity significant for human being? Why? Well, there are two aspects to biodiversity. One is that, after all, biodiversity is the diversity of living species. And they have an intrinsic worth. I think most people would feel that biodiversity has a value per se. All right? But I think from a day-to-day -day point of view, given that we don't observe most of these species, think of all the fungi, bacteria, all the earthworms, all the small insects going around. You don't observe them very much. So you may not think of the intrinsic value of biodiversity. But there is an instrumental value of biodiversity, and here is what ecologists have found. They have found that biodiversity, increases in biodiversity, enhances the productivity of ecosystems. Of ecosystems, I mean mangroves, wetlands, coral reefs. These are the, if you like, the infrastructure, nature's infrastructure on which we all live. So for example, the fisherman depends on coastal fishery, let us say, if it's a coastal fisherman. Now the productivity of that fishery depends, and he may be interested only in one species of fish, but the survival of that species, the bountiful nature of that species in the coast, coastal region, will depend on many other organisms. So biodiversity enhances the productivity of of the thing that you are interested in, which is ability of the coast to produce fish, which is what you uh, harvest and you sell in the markets and you earn an income. So biodiversity has an indirect 
value, huge indirect value. Indirect because it is enhances the services and goods that ecosystems offer us. So for example, a healthy mangrove forest not only has wood, produces wood, but it's a nursery for fish. It also withstands the terrors of uh, typhoons and storms and protects villages, people living on the other side of the mangroves. So the mangrove is giving you several services and the health of the mangrove depends on the biodiversity in the ecosystem in which the mangrove happens to reside. So that's an indirect benefit of biodiversity. And so in a sense, it's absolutely essential uh, to economic well-being. Very good, important point there is what you said, ecological, uh, actually nature infrastructure there. Uh, yes. for, and you talk about uh, coastal life there. It's not just we see from the harvest and the value or the, the value of the eco economic activity there. We should see the really small list species in the sea because it's the chain there to uh, sustain our lives in, in the planet. Um, as you talk to many government organization, um, business leader, um, do you think our government do enough to, um, of course, to count nature in our economic system? Of course, some people argue that we have carbon footprint, we have um, carbon trade in some countries, not every country in the world, but in some countries in Western in Asia too. Um, do you think they do enough? Is this policy enough for you? No, the answer is no. Of course they're not doing enough. Not only are they not do doing enough, I don't think really biodiversity, the infrastructure that I'm talking about, not just carbon uh, and the atmosphere, I'll come back to that in a minute, that's really alien to uh, our educational system. It's alien to the thinking of ministries of finance, banks, uh, industry, you name it. The only ministries which will have some interest in it would be Ministry of Environment. Well, of course they would, but they're not exactly very powerful. So in a way, I would think that the, the, the problem is really quite enormous that we face. And I think you yourself just pointed out why we might be missing nature. One reason is that for a variety of technical features of nature, one of which is that nature is mobile, she moves. The wind moves, the wind blows, if you like. Uh, the rivers flow. So things that you do here get carried, have consequences far away at a distant time. So you can't price, you can't cost these damages easily, okay? So what I do may be damaging people somewhere else, but the fact that damage is not part of the cost that society bears because of my activity. So markets, there are no markets for many of these goods. So they are missing from not only national accounts, like as I said, GDP doesn't include depreciation, but they're missing from day-to-day -day accounts of companies. So they therefore go missing. So the only way to handle it is to educate ourselves in ecology to understand that this is a major, the absolutely fundamental input in our lives. Not only can we, we have to, just to breathe clean air is an essential part of our life. If it's a polluted air, our life expectancy is reduced. So there is a direct benefit of having natural nature healthy as opposed to unhealthy. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also the case, as I've been arguing previously, that nature is part of the factors of production, is one of the factors of production. So for example, take a wetland. A wetland, one of the characteristics of a wetland is that it houses insects and birds who pollinate agriculture. So that's an indirect benefit that agriculture enjoys from the fact that there is a wetland. Another thing that wetlands produce is natural cleansing of water. You enjoy that, by the way, in your park here, Central Park. You get clean water. One reason is that it's a wetland and nature has a way of cleaning it. Now, if, nature, if you destroy the wetland, you will have to find an alternative way to get clean water. You'll have to have, to have a filtration plant. That's going to cost two millions of 
baht, billions of baht probably. So you can see how you can, in principle, try and find out what the value of these ecosystems is from asking the question, what would life be like if the ecosystem wasn't there? And there are ways of trying to tease out the contribution that Mother Nature in this various guises in various ecosystems uh, makes to human well-being through output of goods and services. Plus also, of course, the fact that increasingly we now realize that um, if you're absent from nature, it affects your mental health. This is a new finding. So it's not just production of goods where nature is essential. It's our psychological state is influenced by how close we are to nature. If you live in a high rise and don't see any green, other things equal, your mental health will be not as robust as it would be if you were in the presence of green. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Of course it makes sense. Uh, imagine that if we really block in the high rise condo and we wouldn't see sun, no. sun, sun, sunlight or green, uh, green there, of course mental health will be influenced. Very good point that I think education and mental health, as you say, the health intertwine with the nat nature too. Um, as what you said about the biological production yes. here, uh, in Central Park, in Thailand, in Bangkok. That's a very important asset, natural asset for us. So how to, I think, how to maintain it and sustain it in our economic system yeah. from the national account is really important. One challenge here I want to ask you, if I may, of course, as what, is, what I said, if you talk to many sites, business, government, um, normally after your wisdom, you talk to them, um, Normally they support it, support your idea, or they have a fall out, think that, okay, this is too, too uh, perfect for them. It's right now in this state, it's not possible to have this nature productivity in, in the economic, economic system. Do you think, uh, do they support more or they have a doubt? No, I've had a very easy ride on this problem um, in a way that, I think, I think your, your, your question is um, built around the yeah. fact that I produced a review of the economics of biodiversity for the UK government two and a half years ago. And it was received very favorably by the U UK Treasury, which was sponsoring the review, which asked me to uh, write the review. And its reception has been far greater, uh, much more uh, easy than I had expected. I don't know, I, I, perhaps I shouldn't say that because I don't know if I had any expectation, but nobody has questioned it. And one reason is that the argument is correct. So that's, it's not a, it's not a uh, questionable thing. The econo economics that I produced was convincing. That's, but I think it's also the case that the time was right. I think there is a general widespread perception that we are getting things wrong. And this widespread perception is in every country. Uh, that I, I know of, um, that we're getting things wrong because urban centers are very highly polluted, that the uh, water system is crashing, um, then you see dying ecosystems because you're dumping waste into them, and fishery stocks are depleted. So there's something wrong. And if, if there is too much congestion in a place, for example, you try and set it right by expanding the, creating a highway, you know, or an over, over a bridge or underground, there are visible things and you can cope with them in principle, in principle, it makes, takes money. But when nature goes um, unhealthy, it's not necessarily immediate that she's unhealthy. Your soil looks the same, but the soil may be far less productive than it used to be. And you won't know it. It's the farmer who knows it. Okay? And the farmer may not know why the soil is becoming unhealthier. Well, this may be because you have used so much of chemicals that you have killed the fungi. But the fungi you don't see because the fungi are inside the soil. 
So, and, and what, how would you expect a government official to notice this? So I think this absence of an awareness cre has created the problem, but I think the timing of my review was right in the sense that there is a growing awareness. The only thing is now a big challenge is how do you direct that awareness to public policy, institutional reforms, uh, valuing nature such that that value is included in investment project evaluation. When a government, let's say, builds a road which has to go over a wetland, the road is a good thing because it allows traffic to pass. On the other hand, it's a bad thing because the wetland is being destroyed. So you have to balance these two things. In the past, the loss was not included. Today, somebody will say, yes, there is a loss because of the wetland uh, being destroyed. And then now there'll be pressure on the government to actually include that loss before it says yes to the highway project. So the trouble is that I think this process is going to be very slow. And we are already so heavily burdening nature in the world economy. Uh, there's a lot of data on this, and my review points to the fact that the demands we make on nature as a whole, or the globe as a whole, exceeds nature's ability to supply, meet that demand on a sustainable basis. One example is, of course, carbon circulation. And that's the increase in, you could think of the atmosphere as the asset into which we are, we are using as a sink for a pollutant, which is carbon. And the rate at which we are dumping carbon exceeds nature's ability to, to recycle it, which is causing the problem. So that's a universal problem. Now, it's not just carbon, it's many other things. It's over nitrogen, it's over phosphorus, it's over a whole variety of goods. And uh, we are eating into these ecosystems. Now, it'll take time. The problem is, as I say, because the, the demand, excess demand is so large that we are in danger of moving into tipping position problems. That, you know, if, it, if the weather climate system tips into an irreversible uh, new state where our infrastructure, physical infrastructure, is not geared to withstand, you know, hurricanes all the time or heat waves or cold waves, then we have serious problems ahead of us. And so the matter is very urgent, but I don't know, I don't see any evidence mm. that uh, people, ultimately in democratic society, it's the people who are going to be the engine of change yeah. through the elected officials. So we tend to say it's all governments, not active. It's at the end of the day, it's we who are not active. It's, we should be more uh, educated in these problems because they matter for our children and our grandchildren. Mm. It's for our next generation to right. public policy. Actually, it takes a lot of, of time to revise it because, of course, it yeah. includes governments, yeah. everything. Uh, that's what you said. Uh, I think speedy moves to change is really important. But uh, of course, it takes a lot of time. We still have to see the pushing point here, um, the changing point here, no, not just in uh, Western country, in the world, because we're all linked together. Last question, of course, I want to get your wisdom on your suggestion to Thai government. Of course, we see right now um, foreign direct investment come to Thailand um, in the eastern seaport, the eastern economic corridor. Um, most of them, of course, we see a lot of EV brands come into Thailand and um, there's some debate about the production of EV battery would, of course, generate a lot of waste. Um, what's your suggestion to Thai government? <laughs> well, you've asked the wrong person. I'm not an expert on the Thai uh, economy at all. I'm far removed. So anything I say mm. has to be of a more general kind, not specific to Thailand, mm. but to a tropically based country which exports primary products, say. And you're exporting, of course, many other things, but primary products. I think one of the dangers of the kind of investment that you've just now mentioned is that it's very easy to miss out the damage that is caused, that you mentioned, the waste. It's very easy to miss out because, for the reasons I've just already been, we've been discussing, because the waste creation is a degradation of nature and it's not valued 
So it will not be included in the cost-benefit analysis that goes in, into the decision of whether to have in, in, encourage that investment or not. Now, every time you do that, the host country is losing wealth. So one of the things that my review was at pains to emphasize is that countries, tropical countries, which are trying to emerge uh, into, uh, into a middle-income, middle upper-income country, um, are in danger of ruining some of their natural infrastructure, nature's infrastructure, um, because they won't be costed. And the investment will look very good because the associated damage is not being included in the cost-benefit analysis. But now think of this in the, the same thing in a different language. You're giving money to a foreign investor. You're losing money to a foreign investor because he's getting or it is getting the benefit of this investment on the cheap. So I would, this would be a general recommendation I would make to all countries which are not advanced in the sense of, say, uh, as, as, as industrial as, say, for example, China is or the United States is, to be aware that exports and foreign investment domestically have a hidden cost, which is the transfer of wealth from the exporting country to a, perhaps a richer country. So you need to price your export products at a higher level than a, a rate than you currently do because you're not costing the, da the damage you're inflicting on yourself. Hmm. But that's, I think, a very general prescription. I would not just make it to Thailand, but I would make it to the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa which is, of course, much poorer. Uh, most of the countries are far poorer there than Thailand is, and yet they're losing money. They're losing wealth by, by this intense desire to export primary products to richer countries. Yeah, I think they are losing wealth, of course, losing the, the loss of nature to natural resources. Yes, well, that is the wealth. That's the component of yeah. wealth I'm talking about, mm. namely nature. Yeah, of course. So, um, of course, it looks good on balance sheet, as, as what you said. Uh, of course, Thailand um, attract a lot of foreign investment. It's good, looks fine on the balance sheet, but actually we lose on nature. Yeah, it's a bad already. balance sheet. It's mm. an inaccurate balance sheet. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. That's exactly right. Great to have you on, with, on the show. Uh, Sir Partha Sarathi Dasgupta. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure Thanks meeting for you. Your wisdom.